British Army headquarters, Northern Ireland, an IRA bomb has just gone off. As a cameraman begins filming, a second bomb explodes outside the barracks medical center. Leave it. It fatally wounds one of those injured by the first bomb. For many months, Sinn Féin leaders have mouthed the words of peace. This morning, the IRA spat their hate at the British nation. A British soldier died. I sent him there, Mr. Adams, so spare me any crocodile tears. Don't tell me this has nothing to do with you. I don't believe you, Mr. Adams. I don't believe you. For 18 months, an IRA ceasefire had encouraged John Major to try to bring Sinn Féin's president, Gerry Adams, into negotiations about Northern Ireland's future. Now these efforts came to a dead end. That summer, a retired British Mandarin arrived in Belfast on a secret mission. Somebody said after Canary Wharf, when the ceasefire had been broken, that Sinn Féin were very anxious to find a British interlocutor who would convey their views to the British government. To meet him, Sinn Féin sent Jerry Kelly, who had served 13 years in prison for bombing the Old Bailey. We met in the Redemptorist Monastery in West Belfast, and throughout the proceedings, Jerry Kelly sat directly under the great big statue of the Sacred Heart. I was trying to get them to see that blowing up people on the mainland actually didn't produce the results they wanted and that it simply alienated people. I told them that the um, British government had made a complete mess of this and that John Major in particular and that I believed they had done it for uh, party political reasons. I was making the argument the two governments would go ahead without Sinn Féin being in the negotiating process. Gradually Sinn Féin would become progressively irrelevant. I think he, he came to threaten and uh, it was never going to work. And he said, that would be blackmail. And I said, well, what do you call blowing people up on the mainland if that's not a form of blackmail? Jerry Kelly reported back to Jerry Adams, who continued to call on the British government to bring Sinn Féin into negotiations. In the first flush of victory, the new Prime Minister went straight to Northern Ireland. There were a lot of people advising me, I mean gently but firmly, to have nothing to do with it because it was an impossible situation, it could never be solved. But I, I was determined to do it and I, I knew I had to do it fairly quickly. He chose a unionist platform to send a tough message to Sinn Féin. None of us in this hall today, even perhaps the youngest, is likely to see Northern Ireland as anything but a part of the United Kingdom. My message to Sinn Féin is clear. The settlement train is leaving. I want you on that train, but it is leaving anyway, and I will not allow it to wait for you. You cannot hold the process to ransom any longer, so end the violence and end it now. The Prime Minister knew the cards were stacked in his favor. The IRA campaign in England was going badly. Sinn Féin argued that this was the moment to make negotiation their main tactic. They persuaded the IRA, who announced an unequivocal restoration of the ceasefire. So Sinn Féin at last received an invitation to join the all-party talks on the future of Northern Ireland. Ian Paisley's Democratic Unionist Party promptly walked out. It is clear that IRA Sinn Féin have bombed and murdered their way to the table. And no decent unionist will sit at that table. This was a challenge to the largest unionist party and their loyalist allies. 
their leader produced a characteristic compromise to act tough but stay in the talks. We are not here to negotiate with Sinn Féin, but to confront them and to expose their fascist character. Sinn Féin arrived at the British government offices where the talks were held. They brought with them their symbols, the Irish flag and a portrait of the IRA's most famous martyr, the hunger striker Bobby Sands. But did they renounce the armed struggle he had died for when they signed a promise to use exclusively peaceful means? There's been a fairly uh, sharp debate uh, around all of that. What did it mean? Uh, was this meaning that, uh, that Sinn Féin were being asked to sign up to a denial of, of the IRA, to a denial of, uh, of the right to, to armed struggle? The real message that was being uh, put out to people and which I participated in and very forcibly put forward was that we shouldn't allow our hands to be tied. You know, let's get involved in this negotiating process. There may be uh, all sorts of unpalatable difficulties for people, but let's overcome those difficulties. Complete and total nonsense. There was no way that the Republican movement, and particularly the IRA, were going to concede. Denying the right to future generations to challenge Britain by force of arms. Those who were having doubts about the peace process included some powerful Republicans, Mickey McEvitt, who was reputed to be the IRA's quartermaster general, and his wife Bernadette, the sister of the IRA martyr Bobby Sands. When these concerns or doubts would be raised, the response from members of Sinn Féin were, it's only a bit of paper, it really means nothing. Uh, we're still going to achieve our, our objectives. We are Irish Republicans. Uh, we do not want an internal settlement within the North. Um, we wanted this uh, negotiating process to finally result in the uh, coming together of all of the people who lived on the island of Ireland. I believe that, 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 that what was an offer was an internal settlement, that it was a return to Stormont, and that uh, it would not lead to United Ireland. Behind Stormont, the former Protestant Parliament, Adams and McGuinness were discussing exactly what the dissidents most strongly opposed, taking office in Her Majesty's Government of Northern Ireland. Whenever we would stroll around uh, the grounds of the place, he and I, uh, on our own, you know, Jerry would say, you know, there's a very good prospect that, uh, that we could be in here. We're going to end up in there. If we can get the, uh, the safeguards, if we can get the 50-50 uh, split for up par sorted out. The safeguards Sinn Féin required would not be easy to secure. They included disbanding the Royal Ulster Constabulary, getting British troops off the streets, and the immediate release of all IRA prisoners. US Senator George Mitchell was in charge of the negotiations. The first meetings were disastrous, uh, angry, harsh, recrimination. Uh, you're a liar, don't call me a liar. We argued um, we hadn't engaged in 30-year war, we hadn't uh, had caused people to disappear, we hadn't buried bodies in beaches. They saw us as, as terrorists, as, you know, all of the demonizing caricatures that they had in place. Jerry Adams knew rightly that we were not prepared to talk to him. So when he would meet people in the corridor, he would make a, some gesture, you know, good morning or something like that. But I, I ignored the men. Most of my best discussions with the unionists were in the men's room, uh, where they were a captive audience, and uh, it was possible to engage in some conversation. Sometimes uh, one-sided, but also it was obviously that the more rounded human beings are, did want to say hello, did want to say how you doing, did want to say it's a good day, did want to say you're fiddling on my foot. Thank you. Three months into the talks, Senator Mitchell could not even get the parties to agree an agenda. I thought things couldn't get worse, and of course they promptly got much worse. Republican inmates at the Mays prison have shot dead a leading loyalist prisoner. 
Billy Wright was shot five times in one of the country's top security jails. Just sickened us all. It sickened all good loyalists. And such a great loyalist could die at the hands of scum in a place where he thought that he was protected by the British authorities. Of course I'm embarrassed by it. Anybody would be. It's an embarrassing situation, to say the least. What I'm more embarrassed about is what it potentially does to the peace process. The Loyalist prisoners had been backing the negotiations. If they withdrew their support, Northern Ireland could be back at war within days. I said, would it help if I went and talked to them? Mo Molam went on her own to implore the Loyalist prisoners, convicted terrorists, not to destroy the peace process. We felt angry and frustrated and felt that there was a... We, can't, we don't feel as if we should support this anymore. They said, you must understand how important this is for us because, and we have to be sure you're going to be straight, because if it breaks down, it isn't going to be Trimble and his middle class unionists that are going to hurt. It's going to be the working people that we represent and they will get the brunt of the killings. And I said to them, it was clear that if the ceasefires broke down, we'd all be in trouble. She says, the regime in here will go back to the old regime, you know, the lockups and no ablutions and crapping on a plastic pot in your cell. And uh, actually says, is that a threat, Mo? And she says, no, that's a promise, Michael. And uh, had she been a man, I'd say she's got big kahunas. Mo Molam's gamble paid off. The Loyalist prisoners agreed to maintain their support for the negotiations. But some of Billy Wright's friends went looking for revenge. A few weeks later, two of them selected a pub in the quiet village of Points Pass and went in shooting. Caught in the line of fire were two close friends. Philip Allen, a Protestant, had just asked Damien Trainer, a Catholic, to be the best man at his wedding. The local MP was quickly at the scene. I was standing at the corner, everybody, deathly silence. Senior police officer came over and called me away and he said, they're both dead, you know. Years of killing had dulled the province's senses, but this double murder shook both sides and made the politicians look across the sectarian divide. I went over then again the next morning. It was a miserable day. I was doing interviews at the side of the street and I saw David Trimble's car. There's a little bit of the villages in my constituency and the bulk of the villages is in Seamus Mallon's constituency. While I was there, uh, Seamus joined us. He had come entirely independently and we decided that we would go together through the village. So we went down to Mr and Mrs Allen's house, sympathised with them. We came back up through the village up to Mr and Mrs Trainers. We spoke to them and then we went to Mr and Mrs Canavan who owned the bar where the shooting took place. It wasn't pre-organised, could now couldn't have been, but it just was right. It was right in the sense that the community expected us and wanted us to do, to do it together. And it was right in the way in which the entire community responded. This moment of unity gave George Mitchell his chance to get the talks moving. They had talked for nearly two years. I thought to myself, these guys can talk for 20 years if given the opportunity. And it was at that point that I concluded that the only possibility for success required an early, fixed, and unbreakable deadline, which I thought, uh, after looking at the calendar, should be Easter weekend. The deadline George Mitchell gave them was just two weeks away. The Prime Minister promptly invited the Unionist negotiators to Chequers to find out their price for going into government with Sinn Féin. We were dealing in, in terms of the discussions in Chequers not with the minutiae, not with the detail, but with the broad areas of concern. I remember I was, I was under quite a lot of pressure that day because it was my wedding anniversary and Sheree and I were going to have dinner together. Um, and. Therefore, although I, the meeting was important and it was a Sunday and I wanted to make sure that 
we, we didn't go on too long, but we felt it was absolutely vital that the government support us in requiring uh, tangible evidence of the commitment by those linked to terrorist groups in terms of progress and decommissioning before there could be any question of them taking up office. I certainly said to, to Geoffrey that we would support the inclusion of decommissioning as part of the overall agreement. He said that he understood our concern and that the government would support us in the final round of the negotiations. However, I also said, because this is important, that we had to get all the elements of the agreement together and that this was going to be a process that would take place over time as the agreement itself was implemented. What a, what a greeting. The last week of negotiations had to square the circle of 30 years of conflicting demands. The Ulster Unionists wanted power to return to an elected government at Stormont, the parliament they used to dominate. Northern Ireland's largest Catholic party, the SDLP, also wanted an elected government but only if Catholics had an equal share of power. Sinn Féin's goal was a united Ireland. As a first step, they demanded a substantial role for Dublin in running the North. The question was, how much power would the British concede? The Irish Prime Minister, or Taoiseach, was not impressed by what the British were offering. If we are talking about setting up uh, north-south bodies, uh, that have not implementing powers, that are not executive, uh, that are really ad hoc and, and chat shows, um, well then I'm not in the business of negotiating. Uh, I'll, I'll make my position very clear tonight in number 10. I was ready to remove what was the big issue for decades to make the necessary changes in, in, in our constitution uh, and to uh, accept uh, the, the entity uh, of, of Northern Ireland. The only way I could possibly do that was be able to show on the other side that the reason we made those moves were for meaningful north-south bodies. Bertie of course made it clear that if he, if he was going to get through the difficult changes to the Irish constitution and drop the territorial claim to Northern Ireland, that it was important in those circumstances that he had something to show for it. But I also pointed out to him the unionist concerns that these shouldn't be a ram to push them into a united Ireland against their will. I held the biggest card. Um, uh, I, I held the card that was, was either going to recognise Northern Ireland uh, as an entity uh, and was going to make the constitutional change or was not. Tony Blair was persuaded and their officials spent four days drawing up a list of bodies that would give Dublin extensive powers in the north. When the document was distributed to the parties in Belfast, the unionists hit the roof. It really was the embryo of a united Ireland. This paper is unacceptable to the Ulster Unionists. I personally could not be identified with it. Mr. Taylor, is this, is this, is this document a dead letter as far as you're concerned? I wouldn't touch it on a 40 foot pole. Obviously, the, the desire of the Irish to pre-cook everything was a major problem for us. I remember David got in touch immediately and said, well, this, this document's unacceptable, the, 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 particularly on the north-south bodies, they go far too far. Um, I had to say, when I, when I studied the document carefully, I thought that, that he had a point. It was pretty obvious if we would have any chance of rescuing this thing, then I had to go there and, and try and do it. With only three days left before George Mitchell's Good Friday deadline expired, the Prime Minister set off for Belfast. A day like today, I mean, it's not a day for sort of sound bites, really. Um, we can leave those at home, but I feel, the, I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder in respect of this. I really do. The Prime Minister called in David Trimble. This was an agreement which could not be changed. Now, that in itself gave me even more difficulties. Tony Blair listened sympathetically, but he was bound by the agreement he had made with the Taoiseach. And the Taoiseach wasn't there. His mother had died, and he was accompanying her coffin to the church when his officials told him the Unionists had rejected his terms. They literally had walked away from the gravesite when I got a call uh, from one of my officials and rather insensitively said to me, will you be up soon? 
Bertie Ahern flew straight from his mother's funeral to Belfast to face the angry unionists. What actually uh, frightened the unionists was the length of the list that we had and the, the fact that it included the kitchen sink. I understood and I think was able to convince them that, that we wanted this to be a progressive thing built up from the ground. The Taoiseach agreed to reduce the number and power of the cross-border bodies. I very much appreciated the fact that on the day in which his mother was being buried, that he came to Belfast to involve himself directly in these discussions. I thought that was in itself a very clear indication of his commitment uh, to produce something rather than to seek excuses for failure. The Unionists were triumphant. It was Thursday evening, only three hours before George Mitchell's deadline. Their next task was to devise a form of government that would win the consent of both communities. The preparatory work on this had been done by the largest Catholic party, the SDLP. I said to the Unionists that uh, we were totally committed to a system of government in Northern Ireland where all parties would be included, uh, including Sinn Féin. Uh, so that all sections of our people would be represented in government. We then said, you've got to have a safeguard uh, that if paramilitaries are elected in significant numbers, then they're not automatically in because they've got to demonstrate an entitlement, or a commitment, I should say, uh, to exclusively peaceful means. After four hours of talks, they had a deal. Protestants and Catholics had finally agreed to share power. David Trimble left to get a few hours sleep, but Sinn Féin had not so far engaged with the negotiations. It looked as if Sinn Féin were, were, were not going to be part of it. My officials told me all the issues that they were raising, and I sat down with Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams, looking at the questions they raised, and I painfully went through every single one of those with Mo Molan. She to and fro with Prime Minister Blair. They brought in some people who were obviously members of the IRA Army Council. You don't ask names, you just say hello and you get on with it. At the top of the list of Sinn Féin's 73 demands was the release of all IRA prisoners. The issues of prisoners were straightforward. I mean, the prisoners had to be released. The question was how quickly. You know, to release people who have done terrible things, who have murdered policemen, who have um, killed innocent people, uh, this, is a, this is a difficult political thing for, for anyone to do, and there will be a lot of people who will be shocked by that. People have to get a sense that um, whatever ceasefire is in place is, 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 is genuine, it's going to last. You know, this can't just be done overnight. We had said that three years was the least we could cope with because we thought that was going to be very difficult to present as it was. Sinn Féin were arguing for one. They said that was the absolute minimum for them. In the end, we said, taking our courage in both hands, that we'll go for two years. This was not good enough for Jerry Adams. He sent former IRA bomber Jerry Kelly downstairs to find someone who spoke for the other side's terrorist prisoners. Somebody came in and said, Jerry Kelly's coming down the corridor. Uh, he, he's looking for people. A rap came to our door. Forty heads turned uh, as I opened the door, and there were two members of Sinn Féin, one of whom was Jerry Kelly. I said, look, could I speak to you? and uh, I was still ignored. I was quite shocked. The IRA killed my father. I didn't think it was a good idea to bring them in. I went out into the corridor to speak with him, and he pointed out the obvious. I said, look, the prisoners affect all of us, they affect uh, loyalists and Republicans. I think that if we take the same position, then we'll have the prisoners out uh, quite sharply. Jerry Kelly returned to Sinn Féin's offices while the Loyalists conferred. I then went up the stairs to look for Jerry Kelly. And I actually didn't find Jerry Kelly, I found Jerry Adams. And I said, look, uh, Jerry Kelly has just been down and asked me to push and shove the British government. I'm saying we're not doing it. And I think Adams' words were something like, well, you know, you're missing a great, oppor missing a great opportunity. Here. Jerry Adams was still insisting that all prisoners be out within a year. The midnight deadline had already passed. With no deal in sight, Tony Blair phoned a friend. Tony Blair calls me. And I can't remember, it was 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. I told him they could call me at any time and they took me at my word. Kenny says he needs some help with Jerry Adams. 
The president tackled Adams about prisoner release. Jerry said that he needed the prisoners because that would help him to sell it to the IRA because he still had people in the IRA that really didn't believe in the principle of consent. You know, they wanted uh, to get out of Great Britain. And I told him that, uh, you know, he, that I thought he was going to have to wait for the Catholic birth rate to change the electorate for that to happen. <laughs> I, I joked with him about it. I said, you know, your numbers are getting better over time. I told him that people who were most affected by British rule in this country had to see, in terms of the military occupation of their neighbourhoods, an end to that quickly. Had to see the prisoners home quickly. Well, I just said, Jerry, you got to understand, I mean, this is a, a nightmare for Blair. Because if there's any act of violence after any of these guys get out, he'll be accused of basically being made a dupe for murderers. And uh, it's, so it's hard for him. And the longer he gets to wait, the more he can point to acts of good faith which justify this clemency you're asking him to exercise. And he said, okay, I'll see what I can do. Jerry Adams agreed to wait two years for the release of all prisoners. Now came the most difficult issue, decommissioning. We made it clear from the very beginning that uh, it would be a serious blunder for, for anyone to uh, make a, a precondition of our participation in an executive, uh, an issue that uh, decommissioning. Uh, must take place. Final sessions of the Thursday night ended up at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning in, in Tony Blair's office in, in, in Castle Buildings with Martin McGuinness and Jerry Adams. They said they couldn't uh, answer um, for the IRA and they couldn't negotiate for the IRA. They could not sign up for something that, that they just had no power of delivery over. Uh, and that was the position, so it was a question of getting um, it, what was available. As the sun rose over castle buildings, the two governments agreed to devise a formula Sinn Féin could accept. If decommissioning were a precondition to joining the executive, then that was something they, they couldn't accept, but they accepted the obligation of decommissioning within the context of a process. It was a good conflict resolution that all of the parties would use their influences in their good offices, that all the parties would be committed to peaceful and democratic means. There was a general conclusion that we'd got almost as much as we could reasonably expect. Uh, and that, you know, we just agreed on, on the, uh, the formulation of what I would say to the cameras. And uh, I just went out and got some fresh air just to, uh, just to get that clear in my head. Many of the checks, balances and safeguards which we argued for during the negotiations have now been secured. At 10 that morning, the Unionists received the final text of the agreement. They were shocked. The party they called the political wing of the IRA had negotiated their way into government without surrendering a single bullet. Myself, uh, John Taylor, Jeffrey, Reg MP, Ken McGuinness, uh, five of us went up to see the Prime Minister on this issue. I said to the Prime Minister, um, you gave us an undertaking at Chequers when we met, that you would support us in having a clear requirement for progress on decommissioning to be made before those linked to terrorist organisations um, could take up office in the Assembly. That's not in the agreement, Prime Minister. Of course decommissioning is a part of this process, but it's going to happen as part of the process. It, it, it's, it, to take it out and isolate it as the only issue, I don't think is sensible. You've got consent, you've got an Assembly, you've, uh, as you've got North-South institutions that you can live with and have a veto over. In other words, his argument to us was, you've got all your principal objectives achieved. The Prime Minister said, I know what your problems are, but I'm sorry, we cannot change. This is the final document, and you must either run with it or not. And we said, well, it looks as if we can't run with it. I really was concerned at one point that you should just get up and walk out. And I remember actually getting up and saying to look, for goodness sake, 
calm down, we will sort this out, there is a way through. The Unionists went away and spent all afternoon waiting to see what assurance the Prime Minister could offer. People knew that we hadn't got as much of our wish list as we would want. They knew that if we walked away, we would be surrendering things that we did want. The rest of the delegates were wondering what was taking the Unionists so long. The day after the expiry of George Mitchell's deadline, the building had run out of food, drink and cigarettes. I'd ran into uh, Mark Matra and this was sometime towards the middle of the day. I said to Martin, I said, well, what's, what's wrong now? What's the problem? And uh, I said, it's you, Martin. <laughs> you know, the fact that you're, you're going to be in government. <laughs> After 36 hours without sleep, the Prime Minister finessed the problem. He sent a letter to the Ulster Unionists, promising that if the decommissioning provisions proved ineffective, he would support changes to the agreement. I was standing there, starting to open the letter, I saw John Taylor uh, was coming up beside me, so as I was reading the letter, uh, I held it so that John could read it at the same time as me, and as we reached the end of the letter together, John said, oh, well, that's fine, we can run with that. But the letter did not satisfy everyone. I informed the leader that, um, that I was returning to my constituency. It wasn't a walkout in the sense that the negotiations had been concluded anyway. The two governments and the political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. The agreement proposes changes in the Irish Constitution and in British constitutional law to enshrine the principle that it is the people of Northern Ireland who will decide democratically their own future. In 29 weeks of negotiations, the Ulster Unionists and Sinn Féin had not exchanged a word but now they had agreed to go into government together. George Mitchell could at last go home. I have that bittersweet feeling that comes in life. I'm dying to leave, <laughs> but I hate to go. Before the agreement could take effect, all parties had to vote for the deal. You, Doherty. Butler, Joe Connell, Harry Duggan. Welcome home, comrades. To help Sinn Féin's leaders win over the movement, the government granted a weekend parole for the four longest-serving prisoners, a taste of what was on offer if they voted yes. The next month, in separate referendums, the majority of the population in both Northern Ireland and the Republic approved the Good Friday Agreement. The Ulster Unionist David Trimble became First Minister and the SDLP's Seamus Mallon his deputy. It looked as though Northern Ireland's troubles were finally over. But a few Republicans regarded Sinn Féin's acceptance of the agreement as surrender. There was nothing in the agreement to suggest that there was a stepping stone approach to a united Ireland. The agreement was very explicit. Um, there were numerous sections spelt out very, very clearly that, uh, in its words, Northern Ireland was an inextricable part of the United Kingdom until the majority decided otherwise. You can have everything you want. You can have equality. You can have um, representation in, in a government. You know, you can have Catholic policemen smashing your head in, as well as Protestant policemen. You can have um, you can have the Irish language spoken, but you can have everything you want within the union. 
but you can't have the one thing that the struggle was about and that was the restoration of national sovereignty by, by the end of the British presence on the island of Ireland. In August, armed Republicans who rejected the Good Friday Agreement struck. Styling themselves the real IRA, they planted a bomb in the market town of Omar, killing 29 people, including nine children. It was the worst atrocity in the history of the Troubles. Sinn Féin had never condemned a Republican act of violence. Now the peace process hung in the balance. I hope that the people involved will reflect upon the enormity of what they have done. I would like whoever is responsible to accept that responsibility in a public statement. And I want them to cease. I want them to stop. Omar served as a warning. The men of violence had not gone away. A year of stalemate followed with no IRA decommissioning. David Trimble's rhetoric began to sound tired. The position of the Ulster Unionist Party is, and will remain, in a simple little phrase, you've heard it before today, no guns, no government. The two governments tried George Mitchell's trick of setting deadlines, but to no effect. We've got everything there ready to go. We've decided the principle of consent, the changes to the Irish Constitution, the Assembly is there, the North-South bodies are there, ready to run. We've got everything there, ready to go. Eventually, the British and Irish governments turned to George Mitchell himself. They persuaded him to return to Belfast to break the deadlock. How long are you going to be staying for, sir? Well, I don't know. If George is good at one thing, it is that he can concentrate minds. And he decided to take us to the American ambassador's residence in London to Winfield House. We'd come in and sit down and he'd look at Martin McGuinness and he'd look at me and he'd say, you two must be related. Uh, uh, McGuinness, McGuinness, there the must be a relationship. And I remember saying to him, I know, mine's the Celtic name. Ken trying to claim that he was more Irish than I was, which I thought was grand, it was great. I said, look, I think what we should all do is just stand up, forget about this, and give each other a great big hug. Uh, which shocked the Unionist and Martin McGuinness, uh, who immediately made it clear that I wasn't speaking on uh, his behalf. There developed uh, not a sense of trust. Uh, one delegate later said trust crept in, but I, I think that was probably overstating it, but a sense of realistic understanding that they were in this together. Uh, 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 Jerry Adams said to David Trimble, uh, we know you're our best chance, and we want you to know that we're your best chance. David Trimble decided to take the chance. You know, it's, it's a question of whether you want things to proceed uh, or, at the end of the day, your basic preference is, is, is not to, to, to make progress. He launched a campaign to persuade his party to go into government with Sinn Féin, without prior decommissioning. It was a risky strategy, and Trimble invited a risky ally to help him, a former member of official Sinn Féin. I believe that you should go into government with Sinn Féin, guns are no guns, with no failsafe, with no protection. Yeah with no protection, and you should dump the decommissioning issue then back where it belongs. You can't last in a hostile land like Northern Ireland for 300 years without having steel in your spine. Uh, and what I wanted to find out is there any way of getting that steel to bend flexibly a bit, uh, to be, the, to be the, 
the reed that bends so, to, so as to survive. You're in the business of making peace, making historical accommodation, and thus securing the union. Look, Sinn Féin fought for 30 years. It's like a kid wanting a bike for Christmas. The bike they wanted was United Ireland. They didn't, they didn't get the bike. Please give them a few speakers. <laughs> What he was saying basically was that unionists should really abandon the idea of decommissioning and leave that up to the government to sort out. People shouted nonsense and it was totally unrealistic and, you know, how on earth would we ever sell that to the unionist electorate? David Trimble's party was due to vote on his policy in a few weeks' time. The majority seemed to be against him. Saving Trimble from defeat was the first test of the political skill of the new Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. David Trimble said he was going to go ahead. I decided to see John Taylor, his deputy, myself. John is a very influential person. He and I very privately went through the position as it was and what the problems were that lay ahead. The big question for them was if they do do this and they give it a chance, what happens if it goes wrong? Are they going to be left to carry the can by themselves? Peter Mandelson reassured them, but Taylor wanted more. He wanted a guarantee. David Trimble came up with a clever device to provide it. He explained to me that he was going to try out this idea of a post-dated letter whereby he, and therefore all the Ulster Unionist ministers, would automatically resign by the end of January 2000, if there has not been progress in the Assembly and especially by Irish and Fein on the issues of decommissioning. Trimble's resignation would destroy the complex power sharing arrangements, so the British government would have to step in with the less damaging alternative, suspension. If the assurances I have got during the week are repeated today, I will certainly be backing him. David, David, he's our man. If he can't do it, no one can. When Trimble revealed his resignation letter to the Unionist Council, they voted to go into government with Sinn Féin. One year and seven months after Good Friday, the agreement could finally be implemented. British and Irish ministers met in Dublin and celebrated the setting up of Northern Ireland's new power-sharing government. We were all gathered in the, in the great hall of uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs. There was sort of champagne flowing and crowds of people. and It was a sort of grand occasion. It was as if we were re-signing the Treaty of Versailles all over again. And it was very exciting. <laughs> I went back straight to Belfast just to make sure everything was running smoothly there. Contrast couldn't have been more stark. I mean, there was a sort of nervousness. People were afraid to smile, as if they were sort of holding their breath, you know, pleased that it was happening, but just waiting for it also to collapse at any moment. May God forgive them for what they've just done to Ulster. May God forgive them because I won't, and neither will the children of Ulster. Neither will the children of Ulster. As Martin McGuinness settled into his job as Minister of Education, everyone waited to see if the IRA would make any move to get rid of its weapons. We've done our bit. And Mr. Adams, it's over to you. We've jumped. You follow. I saw Jerry Adams in early December, and we talked about how things were going. And you know, I said that we needed progress on decommissioning if we were going to keep the whole thing in the air. I certainly told uh, Peter Mandelson that this was a nonsense to think that after 18 months of an impasse, 18 months of no institutions that they're put together in December, there's a break for Christmas, and it's to be sorted out by January and February. He was rather discouraging to me and said that uh, he really didn't think that we were going to get any, you know, substantive shift on decommissioning by the end of January. At the end of January, the international decommissioning body reported to the British and Irish governments that the IRA had done nothing about getting rid of their weapons. I had no doubt suspension was on the horizon. Uh, Tony Blair was, was pressing me all of the time for, for, for uh, Irish officials and myself to try to get more out of Sinn Féin so that it would resolve the problem. The Irish tried for three weeks without success. Then, on the night before Peter Mandelson's deadline for suspension, Friday the 11th of February, 
Sinn Féin's leaders summoned the Irish officials to a safe house in West Belfast. They argued all night and by dawn had made some progress. What was now on the table was for the first time a clear-cut commitment from the IRA to put their arms beyond use. But there was a catch. The arms would be put beyond use only, the IRA insisted, when the parties to the agreement had removed the causes of conflict. It was you know, made clear to the Irish government officials that this was the most advanced position that we could achieve and that what they now had to do was uh, talk to the British government. It was now decision day. Had the IRA gone far enough to prevent suspension? Bertie called me around about 11 o'clock. We had a conversation together about the latest statement from the IRA. It was quite clear that the British government um, did not see that as being sufficient. The difficulty was, as I explained, that it had come so late. The facts came in that morning at 10.45 from number 10 and I spoke to the Prime Minister immediately. We both agreed that it was a good sign, it was encouraging, it represented uh, some, some progress in the right direction. But it was David Trimble and his colleagues who needed to be satisfied. Round right about lunchtime there had been a phone call from the Secretary of State in which he, he was saying in very general terms that he hoped something was happening but he, wa he was not at that stage in a position to tell me what was happening. I wasn't then surprised uh, when uh, Martin McGuinness requested a meeting and I immediately facilitated him. He certainly listened very carefully to what I had to say, but because he didn't speak that much at the meeting, that clearly told me uh, plenty that, that he wasn't uh, in any way enthused by what he had heard. I was there to listen. Uh, I was not there to negotiate or to get involved in a negotiation. McGuinness had a problem. The IRA would not allow their new position to be disclosed unless all threat of suspension was lifted. He didn't tell me anything uh, other than saying uh, that they were working on it, they thought they could sort it out, but they needed a few more weeks. I also told them that the sort of Damocles that the Ulster Unionist Council held over the process had to be removed, that it was absolutely vital that we got away from this continual sense of crisis that these meetings had imposed on the process. And we'd have to withdraw the letters of resignation and there couldn't be any Unionist Council meetings. That wasn't a realistic position. David Trimble phoned me uh, after Martin McGuinness had left him and he was clearly uh, not in a good way. Trimble told the Secretary of State that the deadline had arrived and that if the British government didn't suspend the institutions by six o'clock, he would activate his post-dated resignation letter. Good evening. Within the last half hour, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Mandelson, has suspended the province's power-sharing executive. He said he had no option but to take the decision. Well, I regret very much having to do this, but I have decided to suspend the executive in the institutions. We've got to clear up this issue of decommissioning once and for all. Sinn Féin marched in to see the Secretary of State. He had this arrogant air of, oh, well, the natives are coming in to give me a telling off, let's get it over with and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. He was right about the natives giving them a telling off. We told Peter Mandelson that he had made a huge mistake and that we believed that he would live to regret that mistake. They were absolutely unrelenting. I mean, to, you know, they were sort of pointing their finger at me and saying, this is the biggest mistake you've ever made. This is an historical moment for Ireland which you've destroyed single-handedly. You'll live to regret this. You'll not be able to live with yourself and it got worse and worse. You know, only pausing with Adams to sort of turning, turning to me in the meeting and saying, by the way, you know, we're going to really vilify you as an individual publicly, he said, but you, know, you needn't take it personally. I didn't feel any better for that. Soon afterwards, the IRA announced they were breaking off all contact with the decommissioning body. The peace process had ground to a halt. <laughs> 
A month later, Northern Ireland's politicians paid their annual visit to the White House. God, what an awful St. Patrick's Day it was. Here it was, my last St. Patrick's Day in the White House. I thought it was going to be an occasion of joy. You know, I, I look forward to those St. Patrick's Days so much. I was frustrated and a little bit angry that anybody would uh, not do whatever it took to get the government up and going again. Clinton set his sights on Northern Ireland's first minister, David Trimble. I remember him telling me that he wouldn't be able to maintain his leadership position if it looked to his people as if he were played for a fool on this decommissioning. But that day in Washington, Trimble did risk his leadership. But we are prepared to be involved in a fresh sequence, which probably will not involve arms up front, but it has to involve the issue being dealt with. It has to involve the issue, the matter working. I said that in order, as it were, uh, so that the, the White House would be able to put the issue up to Republicans and say, right, they're prepared to have another sequence. What are you prepared to do? Jerry Adams was due at the White House that afternoon. When Adams came in, uh, the president said, look, what David has done today is very significant. He's really shown that he's prepared to move forward on this process. I think it's critical that you too uh, engage and show that you're prepared to move forward as well. I really tried to get at the bottom of why we couldn't get more movement on decommissioning. I told them that uh, the IRA is essentially a democratic organization. It's leading, whatever you think about it, political activists who have taken this choice of, of engaging in armed actions. He said, look, these guys have been fighting this struggle for 30 years. And um, they're being asked to give up their arms. The IRA. Uh, are not going to decommission on British terms or unionist terms. It has to look like they're giving up their own, their arms, because the people they've been fighting for chose a particular path to peace, and it's being fully implemented. But if they give up their arms before it's clear that this is going to happen, subject to British pressure, then it will look like everything they did for 30 years was for nothing. Back in Northern Ireland, Adams and McGuinness put their heads together. Martin, you want to come with us here then? We can have a... The only people involved in it from our end was myself and Martin McGuinness. We actually stripped it right back because the thing was just so delicate because th this was either going to succeed in getting the institution put in place or, you know, it was going to be our last, uh, our last throw of the dice. I thought the IRA leadership might be convinced that it would be a sensible thing to do to, to support and shore up the Trimble leadership. And we come up with this idea of uh, could, could the IRA open up uh, arms dumps? Of having uh, trusted on all sides uh, international inspectors who would come and inspect a number of uh, IRA dumps and we wish to explore with the British government whether or not there was any potential in that. Sinn Féin took a deal to Downing Street. The inspection of IRA arms dumps in return for Britain reducing its military presence, particularly in the Republican border county of South Armagh. I said, Tony, the best defenders of the Good Friday Agreement in South Armagh are the people of South Armagh. Of course it's true that in the end the best guarantee is the support of the local community. I explained to him, however, if I took a measure against security advice and dismantled some of the security apparatus being advised that this was a mistake and a, a real IRA bomb gets through and, and, and kills people, then people are going to ask some pretty serious questions of me. South Armagh, Tony, I said, is one of the most beautiful parts of Ireland, which it is. And all along every hilltop, there's a hilltop fort. There are military encampments linked all over the place. And the people of the area deserve better than that. I said to Martin, we can deal with this issue, but it's got to be in the context of a genuinely changed situation in, in which not merely is there a ceasefire from the IRA, but th th there is no possible threat. Tony Blair followed up the IRA's arms inspection proposal and quickly arranged a summit at Hillsborough. But as usual, Sinn Féin's consultations with the IRA took longer than expected. Jerry Adams and I have been up effectively all night. 
and we arrived very early in the morning and we presented the two Prime Ministers with uh, a very forward position from the IRA. I remember Gerry Annis Martin McGuinness coming into the study at, at Hillsborough and they had an IRA statement that seemed to us to go significantly further than, than what had happened before and in particular had a commitment, really for the first time, that weapons would be put beyond use. And it was, you know, a huge step forward. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was clearer, firmer, better. I mean, embodied a much stronger commitment than anything that we'd had before. Everything now depended on the Unionist response to the IRA statement. I took the statement up to David in the upper conference hall, a room at uh, Hillsborough Castle, uh, where he and all his colleagues were gathered. And I have to say, he reacted with deep scepticism. I mean, his reaction was quite adverse and quite negative. Uh, it took me aback slightly and made me worried, obviously. You've got to bear in mind that uh, we don't like being bounced into things and we will exercise our own judgment rather than accept someone else's judgment at face value. I pointed out one or two weaknesses in it and David said, well, we can change that. The Unionist leaders settled down to improve the IRA's statement. I came back 40 minutes later and uh, David was busy just with John Taylor, you know, with his portable laptop, you know, doing things, very sort of frenetic activity. I said, what are you, what are you doing, David? I, I said, you're not rewriting the statement, are you? Trimble agreed to get the answers to his queries direct from Sinn Féin. We were assured that uh, no obstacle would be put, that the inspectors would be free to come and go uh, and in install any mechanism they wished. Trimble also required some real progress on decommissioning by the 1st of July 2001. The IRA statement did not accept the July deadline, but they undertook to put their arms completely and verifiably beyond use. This was enough for him to persuade the Ulster Unionist Council to back a return to the executive for the time being. Those promises must be delivered and let there be absolutely no doubt that I and my colleagues will hold the Republicans to the promises they have made. But a year later, no arms have been put beyond use. This time, David Trimble has gone through with his threat to resign, raising the question, can the deal struck on Good Friday survive? Still, the British and Irish Prime Ministers are grappling with a Northern Ireland crisis. The IRA's guns have been silent for four years, but no one can be quite sure how long the end game in Ireland will take. <laughs>